yeah, it seems to be something that's coming up a lot recently, you know, like as we hit against these walls, we're running into these, these moral things, like some of them you don't even expect. And then also from the art world, we've got some litigation that's coming down that's, I'm not sure how I feel about it, either good or bad. I mean, I think either ruling with either side would have had its issues, but I'm not sure if you heard about the, it was um, Andy Warhol. Okay. Uh, against, what was her name? Of course, it, Linda Goldsmith. Right. And Lynn, Lynn Goldsmith actually create, took a picture of Prince back in the 80s, back when Warhol was really early. And a magazine that used his stuff actually paid her for the licensure to use her photograph as artistic reference. And he created the image and they used the image and supposedly all that went down fine. Um, and his image was was different. I mean, it's hers is in black and white and his is colored. And, you know, there's a couple other design things that he changed, like some makeup around the eyes. Um, but then it really didn't come up until his, it was an anniversary, I think, of his death. And they paid the Warhol Foundation, who manages the estate, like $10,000 to use one of the other uh, Prince images that he created. And she did not take kindly to this because she didn't get anything from that. So they've been going through the court and they ended up in the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court ended up ruling that basically because they both use their art in the same instance to be licensed for photography as fine art, that it wasn't enough he didn't take enough creative liberties like it looked too much like the original right and it's been used for the same medium yeah and i guess he monetized so, it didn't he so um interesting yeah i mean it's hard to know where everything's going especially with art i mean um like I, like the data sets in all these language models you know that all the image creation software is using like most of it is not, uh, you know, is without permission of, of the owners of the originals, isn't it? So I don't know, how, how do you actually work through that and go, okay, you know, this prompt outputted a, an artwork that looks like it was done from Andy Warhol um, or whoever the artist is. And how, do, how much of that, you know, should a royalty be delivered if, if it gets monetized or used somewhere? I don't know, like, and how the hell do you even go about trying to tie that down and litigate and um, enforce it. It's nuts. Yeah, I just, I, I'm actually really surprised that she won because there's been a lot of um, like this fair use of if they change enough of it, then yeah. it's not a problem. Like, because yeah. there's a lot of art that does Disney stuff, right? Like, there's a lot of artists that use Mickey Mouse and some most, other most art is inspired by someone or something, and a lot of it is other artworks, right? So, uh, uh, you know, like, where do you draw that line? It's, hard, it's so hard to know. Yeah. Can you, can you even like copyright a style? Yeah. Right? Like, totally. you know, like all style, like that's not, I mean, he used a bunch of lithographs and his lithographs and screen prints are, you know, like that's his style and the characteristics of his paintings are kind of characteristics of that style. Yeah, well, I because mean, and so much music, so much music is, is inspired by, by other artists, especially when you look at electronic music and DJs, like that's what they do all day long. like. How do, do you know how it works with music? I mean, there must be royalties on stuff to a certain extent when stuff gets monetized, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah, usually they, you license it. I think it's anything over eight seconds. Okay. You can use up to eight seconds of a tune. Um, but I mean, if you just change one note in there, then it, it gets a lot harder to prove or to take to court because then it's, you know, like, there's this, there's this really funny thing. You can search for it on YouTube. And basically, most songs are made from like three or four chords. Oh, I know, like the four, four what is it, the four bar song or whatever, four chords. And they can play just about everything. Yeah. Every pop. All the different. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if you're familiar with um, an Australian band called Men at Work. Um, but oh, they, yeah. they had a, a similar issue um, about 10 years ago. They had to pay 
5% of their royalties for the song Down Under. I come from a land down under because there's one part of it um, that sounds like a kookaburra sits on the uh, electric wire. <laughs> you know, some, uh, and, and they actually lost and they had to pay a 5% penalty of that song, um, which was kind of wild because somebody owned the IP rights to that and took them to court and won. Um, so I don't know, it's just nuts. And, and But with AI, like, I don't know, like this is going to be so hard to, to nail down and uh, and litigate, uh, you know, it's a global thing as well. So how does copyright w work over international borders? I guess there must be some agreement between certain nations, is there? I don't even understand how that works. Uh, there are, and certain nations have a stronger, will enforce it stronger than others. Yeah. That's one of the reasons you have so many copies and stuff coming out of the factories in, in China, right? Yeah, of course, because that makes sense. Yeah. All the pieces and the shoes and that kind of thing. Like China has, you know, I don't want to say just, they like just just ignored the, the oh, copyrights yeah. basically. They turned the uh, other among, cheap. Uh, among a whole bunch of other um, <laughs> things as well, but we might, might not go into that. But um, yeah, I, I don't know if you saw the tweet during the week about this AI generated image of an explosion at the Pentagon. Yes, yes, yes. That's one of the th reasons that I wanted to bring this up too. Yeah. It, what, what were your thoughts on that? Oh man. Well, well, first off, you know, there's this problem in our in our news stores where they kind of run with things before they very fact check them as much yeah. as possible. Yep. Um, that's an issue all in itself. But it's funny, right? Because I think that AI AI has kind of taken the limelight over blockchain and you know all these NFTs and stuff in its recent jump ahead of all the things. Definitely. But. It's hard for me to imagine a world where AI images can be, where AI image, uh, real images can be certified outside of the blockchain. So, yeah, it's kind of creating this really amazing use case for blockchain. It, it feels like um, AI is actually the Trojan horse that leads everyone back to blockchain finally, and they will finally get it <laughs> because it's like uh, you know, like. A lot of people just don't understand it, which is fair enough because it's super te technical. But um, I think they will start to if, if that mechanism starts to sort of play out. But again, it's like, how do you get to that point? It's going to be so hard. Like what platform, what standards? I, I don't know. Like it's going to be super fascinating to see. Uh, maybe maybe it'll be some sort of, you know, private blockchains for a whole conglomerate of media organizations and they have to submit their own images through that first. And I don't know. It's going to be really interesting to see how all that plays out for sure. Yeah, I mean, it could be like Getty Images or something, something yeah. of that nature. If they come in and do that. Maybe they're, maybe cameras will start to imprint. That's a good point. Onto, onto, yeah. or you know, like if you have a digital camera, a Sony, maybe you're imprinting the the provenance on there. I, um, I mean, that that's interesting in its own right because it just means that every photo now is going to be raw. It won't be able to get doctored. <laughs> You won't be able to, like the real estate photos, for instance, they always make everything look amazing. They have like fake sunsets coming out the windows and <laughs> all this sort of stuff. And it's like, oh, yeah, that's fake news. <laughs> um, it's okay yeah. when, when you're selling a house to make things a little better than they are. And I, even like just uh, filters on people these days, the filters are in real time, I've gotten so good face filters um, for makeup and all this sort of stuff. So the, the lines between what's real and what's not, um, you know, they're just, they're dissolving before our eyes really. Yeah, all of these uh, these these things that we held to be true are, you know, it's that's why people are getting scared. I think is because their entire realities are changing. I'm yeah. excited. I'm here for it. But you know, a lot of people are just losing their minds. Yeah, I think the thing and, that sort of well, worries me is that how far behind the curve uh, and just how long it takes for things to go through through parliaments around the world and get regulation and. Like, uh, they still haven't caught up with, with what blockchain really is, you know, and they've had 10, no. 10 or more years on that. Um, and this AI thing has come like a tidal wave. So um, I was actually doing a little bit of just reading up quickly before we started this. And because um, to be honest, I haven't delved deep into this at all. But I was just looking at the, the Wikipedia page on the ethics around artificial intelligence. Hopefully that's accurate. <laughs> but given anyone can edit it, <laughs> maybe it's not. <laughs> um, but it was really interesting. I can, if I can just find it, there was um, 
something about Microsoft and their facial recognition software. And they were like, we're really scared about the power of this. I'll see if we can find it. Um, and they wanted some- an old, was, that, was that something that happened a, a bit ago? I think it might be like, you know, 10 years ago or something. You know, it's been a while. Yeah. Um, they're saying, yeah, for example, Microsoft has expressed concern about allowing universal access to its face recognition software, even for those who can pay for it. Microsoft posted an extraordinary blog on this topic, asking for government regulation to help determine the right thing to do. So, you know, this this has probably been coming for a long time. I know this isn't, um, you know, uh, it's only one type of AI, but you know, at the end of the day, all AI really is, is just pattern matching, whether that's your face, um, you know, photos, uh, you know, masses and masses of text, but uh, you know, it all comes back to that same idea that it's being able to parse masses of information and distill it down to an output. So, um, you know, like I don't, I haven't heard anything since about this. So, I wonder what the outcome was. When was that? 2019, apparently. And yeah, I mean, well, I mean, you have to look at it. It's everywhere right now, right? Like, if you can get pictures of people, you could scrub Facebook for pictures of people if you felt so inclined. Oh, and you know, so, like, for sure. I mean, like databases, like, yeah, and absolutely. all, you, and now, like, you you can make your own AI at home. Like, there's downloadable instances of all of these programs. Yeah, have you heard started of? Started um, to get into. Have videos. you heard of st stability AI? I have. I have. Yeah. So. I used it the beginning I, I used that one okay yeah so i think i've got the right product because there's so many of them but apparently this um is an ai company and um i think um Rao powell's done some interviews with the bloke on real vision um emad his name is and he was i think he was trying to like basically he was trying to work out how to treat his son with autism and it led him down the path of ai um apparently he's like a macro investor guy and then he for somehow he got roped in with all the um with all the pandemic stuff and how to uh -huh. harness AI. And he was like helping the governments out with AI. And anyway, he's co continued down that path. He's had some private investment and created his own, you know, a, a guest version of open AI. Um, I think it's closed still. And the idea is that uh, he wants to IPO the technology in every, com every country. Uh, so they all have their own unique data set that's specific to them. And that, mm -hmm. I think that makes some more sense. Like, still sort of scary you still got to trust your governments and, and all of that but i don't know is the is that better than the alternative of just this you know this open source wild thing that's full of all these other biases and all of that i mean at least in your own country it's biased to your own country's culture and religions and um the way that you live and all of that sort of stuff so that'll be really really interesting but the the, the thing that's kind of mind-blowing about it is apparently they've compressed it all down to a single two gig file that you can run on your own computer or your own smartphone. And that's the, the unique selling point, um, the way that they've been able to compress everything down. And they're basically saying, you know, this more or less, you know, means that you don't need the internet, right? And you've got all the information of the internet up to that point, you're sitting in your smartphone. Um, so the applications for that could be profound, especially in developing nations where they don't have good education systems and healthcare systems. So definitely want to keep an eye on, but pretty mind bending. Before I continue, a quick word from our sponsors that make the show possible. It is. And, you know, like, the, it, it's funny that you bring up Stability AI. I thought Stability was the AI was on, and I looked it up. Stability AI is being currently sued by Getty Images because... Right, so they've obviously stolen the, the data from them with a lot of the images then. Yeah, it even yeah. had the water bottle um, oh, that's in it. Funny. That's how they figured it out, because it had the, the Getty Images watermark, which is oops. Um, but what's <laughs> funny is... And you can look in some of them. Some of them do um, Adobe stock images. If you look at some of the early, uh, yep. the first set of Trump NFTs, 
they oh, had really the Adobe box <laughs> image you know, like near the belt buckles and stuff where someone didn't take them out. So that's a fun little Easter egg you can look up. Oh, that's cool. Um, as far as having it for individual states and countries, um, I, I don't, I don't, I mean, I get why you do that for regulatory reasons, right? Because the EU has different privacy laws than the US. Yeah. And, you know, so on and so forth. And you have to comply with all of those. But I, I mean, I, I think that humanity as a whole will suffer if we keep siloing people. Um, I think the beauty of Web3 that's happening is happening because we have people all over the world who are interested in this getting involved. Yeah, um, it's interesting. Like I, I just the way I sort of see it now, and I, I'm pretty new to it, the space. Like I had an interesting conversation on the weekend. Um, I took my daughter to a children's uh, girl's birthday party, and I was chatting to a couple of the other parents about AI. And um, one of the ladies that I was talking to, she was like, oh, "I was trying to write these, you know, kids' books using ChatGPT," and she said, "Like every time." it would turn really dark and you know and, and people would start dying and you know stuff is just not appropriate for a kid's book now i think she was using 3.5 and this was you know 18 months two years ago she was pretty early to it um because she works at the local i think university and they do a lot of stuff there and she's a coder so she was saying how good it is for her code iteration stuff because you know that's pretty pretty binary um stuff either works or it doesn't but when you get into the nuance of, of what's what's real and what's true and it's all opinion and it's just scraped the whole uh, in, information off the internet, you're going to have all these extra biases in there and a lot of dark shit out there on the internet. So I don't know. I just like, I think me thinking forward, I don't know the answers to what the sort of the global source of truth is, truth is going to be um, with it, whether it's uh, open AI or some alternative. But I do definitely see... Uh, companies spinning up their own language models tailored for a specific purpose and marketing that and that's their little defendable mode and it's more around the, the UI UX on the app that they build around their own language models that makes sense so you know I can imagine a nice little smartphone or web app that is just designed to get nice outcomes for children's storybooks <laughs> um, where you can just picture ideas through it and get something back that makes sense in that context rather than using some huge data model that just has all this extra stuff in it that's not really relevant and maybe takes you off course from the desired outcome. So anyway, that's just my random thoughts on it. What do you think? My thoughts would be, um, I would want to see her prompt because yep. I would, you know, like she would have to prompt it to be appropriate for this age level. Yes. Um, uh, could, is there a market for people to put overlays on top of chat GPT? Just like, just like right now, there's these, um, yeah. these people to be like, for $20, you can do a whole bunch of your professional images for LinkedIn. All they're doing is using special prompts into mid journey with yep. your photo. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I, I guess you can sanitize it at that level. Can't you? Um, it, yeah. it just depends how much of the, uh, you know, information in there needs to be filtered out before you get to those, those good outcomes that people are actually, you know, wanting and, and willing to pay for, I guess. Uh, that's gonna be yeah, and maybe, really interesting. Maybe 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 like you say, it's a it's the UI UX image problem, right? Like instead of a prompt, maybe yeah. you have some guidelines that you can put on there, like who is your audience, who is this, who is that, you know, just some drop downs that you can add to your prompt for the layperson to go in there and write their prompt. I think it's um, sort of a point that Robin was making with Luke a week or two ago when they had a chat um, on the podcast was you know, the world that you want to see is the world you're going to get soon. So that'll be, that'll be really interesting and quite, quite dystopian too. Like, you can, I don't know, you are going to have some really interesting outcomes, I think, from all of this, where you already see it with like social media now, how quickly a herd can get swayed into a certain direction. Um, and whether yeah. they really believe it or not, it's real and it happens and, you know, it's tipped elections. Um, so I don't know. It's, it's a really fascinating time at the moment, for sure. It's it's all feelings, right? Even stock markets run like that. Like the stock yeah. markets aren't a very indicator of how a company is or is not doing. No, that's right. But so, like, you can sway entire stock markets with public opinion. Well, that's why they call like them saw, spirit spirit animals. You know, that's the that's the term yeah. because it doesn't make just any like, sense. <laughs> it's all narrative. Just just like when we um, we had just like earlier when we had the Pentagon thing. 
it dropped the S and P by like a whole a huge a margin of points. Yeah, that quick. Yeah, on, I, I, on the tweet it said it resulted in a five hundred billion dollar market cap market cap swing on a fake image, which yeah just goes to show you how how crazy it is. You know, um, once once an idea takes hold, whether it's real or not or true, it just spreads like wildfire, especially with like. Everyone's so hyper connected these days. Um, uh, it was actually like the bank run they had the other day with, I think it was Silicon Valley or Silver Valley Bank, one of the, the two banks that went under. Um, it was like almost on the scale of Lehman Brothers. And what took two weeks when Lehman Brothers went under, uh, I think this happened in like six or 10 or 12 hours because everyone could just withdraw the money through their apps digitally. They'd have to yep. line up at the bank and the bank just fell over like in an instant. So, um, kind of nuts and word got out because of twitter well it feeds right? on itself a bank run feeds on itself but it's that same type of mentality the bank was actually fine it just had a liquidity issue so um yeah interesting yeah interesting times for sure um i was actually i don't know if this is new or not but on that tweet um or the one that i've seen about the pentagon image and the, the stock market sort of flash crash and um pump again They've now got this like stay informed uh, label on Twitter. Have you seen that before? It's like a warning label under the tweet. Yeah, I've seen that. They, they started okay. doing that a couple times. It, it, they right. should be using it more, really. Um, but you yeah. know, like who determines that? Yeah, I guess it's AI. It all goes back to AI eventually. Um, and actually, that's well, exactly. it says under it that users, users suggest a, a note be added to this tweet to clarify, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's um, that's a good policy, better than just um, blanket deleting stuff, because um, you don't want true censorship. I don't think um, you want to have some you know level of freedom of speech as long as it's not uh, crossing a line, a criminal line, um, you know, racism and hate hate speech and that sort of thing. I think it's I think it's a good policy to leave it there but flag it. Yeah, but there's also all this gray area and what what constitutes racism and what constitutes hate. And that's 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 where I struggle with all of this. This like where you know there is no hard and fast. Everything's just shades of grey in life, really. Yeah, uh, yeah. I I think that you know you're gonna find the best knowledge from the people that proclaim from shades of grey. Anyone that's proclaiming that things are black or white or this or that or they're experts or whatever. I mean, there's always more to learn. And anyone that's doing that, I think, is a good red flag to stay away from. Yeah, I just wonder how you go into things like religion, um, where you, there is no zero percent or hundred. You, know, you can't have you can't have a ninety nine percent god. It's like you know, <laughs> they're either there or they're not. Well, I mean, that's a um, personal choice, though. Like you can't, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. That's like me deciding to wear the color red instead of blue, right? Like that's that, that's nothing to do with you, and it shouldn't impact you. Someone else's religion shouldn't impact you. They shouldn't. So you I know, guess the AI, AI responses around things then are going to have to be super nuanced uh, to say, you know, uh, in, in our opinion, you know, this is the vibe. It's not necessarily 100%. Some people believe in God and you know stuff like that. I don't know. It's going to be really wild for sure. Yeah. And it's going to have to stick to more factual stuff, right? Like that was the problem that yeah. they had with AI at the very beginning is that it was, like you were saying earlier, it's full of a lot of hateful stuff. And... It, it was pulling all of this data from everywhere on the internet, but like, you know, how reliable is 4chan? Yeah. Or even Reddit, as far as, you know, like how answers to things, you gotta d decide what those oracles are. Yeah. That's one of the, the things that came up really early in the blockchain and crypto space, uh, probably like 2016 and 17 was when the ICOs started happening really big. And like that became, when I was at these events, they were talking about it was an oracle problem right like how do you the identity oracle is one of the big problems they're starting to solve that now with a bunch of different things but like you know like how do you verify that a person is a person right do you trust new york state to issue my driver's license well how else can we get to that level of certainty without contacting new york state or having to present that level of detail like why should i have to present my my social security number to you which is a, you know, a protected piece of information yeah. for you to verify my identity. Yeah, I guess that's and, where the zero knowledge proofs is obviously what they're sort of trying to implement to help with some of that stuff. But it's still a huge problem. Absolutely. 
and the problem happens with information too, right? Like how do you, if someone Googles or, or does chat GPT on how to fix a roof, right? Like something that is, you know, a thing. And, but there are different schools of thought. There's different schools of thoughts in different regions and countries on the correct way to fix a roof. Like what the regulations are, right? Like yeah. some need a barrier, some don't require a barrier, some require this other thing. Like, and, and you know, it's going to be one of those things that it's going to have to ask questions back, I think, right? Yeah. Like you Google how to, if you do how to fix a roof, Google the way it does it is it looks for your location and it uses that to determine that, okay, you're in New York, New York regulation is this, and it gives me those things. Now, are we going to put that into chat GPT as well? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I know. It's going to be, it's going to be wild. Um, I actually, I don't know if you saw today's podcast with, um, with Robin and Luke um, or not. But- yeah, it was great. Yeah, Robin was sort of saying you're going to start having conversations with articles now, and rather than reading them almost, um, and you know even just any body of text, so PDFs and I guess textbooks, and it'll be a real back and forth thing, which is kind of sort of what you're saying. There's going to have to be some recursive sort of uh, input uh, during the process to uh, to sort of guide you along the right path. I guess it's going to be really really fascinating. It's going to be exciting. I can't wait till it gets to that point, right? Like, imagine going to school and being able to ask your textbook questions. Uh, yeah. What, when am I actually going to use this knowledge in real life textbook? <laughs> that would be the like, oh, question I would have asked. You're here and here, you know, like that. That's it, it's cool when you think about it. I just hope our education systems can can fight to keep up in the correct way you know like we're not we weren't training people how to be like really super successful members of society back when i was in high school uh, I, as much as i have. guess i guess privatization of education is going to be a massive thing i mean obviously you already have private schools at least in australia that's how it works there's, there's publicly funded schools and privately funded schools um they all get public funding to a certain extent and in fact some of the private schools get more which is complete horse shit <laughs> but that's you know the rich get richer um but Someone might come out with some super education app that's AI driven and you start to, on the margins, get families go, actually, this makes more sense for my child right now than the old school methods of, of learning. Um, you know, going into a classroom and, and have some person you don't know anything about and a blackboard and a piece of chalk and some textbooks out the front. Is that the best way to learn? I don't know. Like, that's going to change, you know, soon, real soon, I think. It's gonna have to, and I do not think that's the best way to learn. I did not hate school, but I love to learn. So like, you know, like what if, you know, instilling that love of learning and the ability to teach kids how to learn and people how to learn, right? Because a lot of people in real life that you walk around with don't know how to learn a new skill, which is kind of scary. Yeah, and everyone Um, learns differently too. Like some people are more perceptive to certain things and some people, you know, are are illiterate, but can still learn quite, quite comprehensively in other ways. So. I don't know. It's going to be really, really interesting. Um, I'm certainly confused as a parent with two kids growing up. Um, my son's slowly getting closer to high school age. He's got about three years to go. And I'm just like, what the fuck? I have no idea <laughs> where this is all yeah. going. Are you going to put him in college? Are you going to put him in trade school? Like, uh, Just don't what, know. How do you even advise your child? You know, like, oh, I'm just I, fuck, I, fuck around with mid journey and chat GPT until I work it out, basically. <laughs> That's all you can do yeah. at this point. Start teaching him chat GPT and Mid Journey. Yeah. As much as possible. Thankfully he loves to read. Like that's his that's his safe space. He's, he's with his nose in a book. Um and, and non fiction all non fiction stuff. He's just an absolute sponge of a kid. Um incredible. Um that's so happen. that's that's a blessing. Um my daughter, she's a lot different and a little bit younger, so who knows? Um don't know don't know what to think really, but I guess the thing that you know something to worry about in a way is like we still need to have human interaction. That's super important. And I still think you need a teacher, you need an adult, a peer, a mentor that's in the, in the space to help guide your kids and the kids to have that social interaction with each other. But uh, I do think like the Blackboard and textbook model, that's that's dead already, to be honest. The universities are gonna get gutted over this, I think. Oh yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, and they made themselves too expensive to be able to, you know, make yeah. sense. like. Yeah, you know, if it costs a third of the cost that it costs, then it'd be a lot different, right? But oh, you know, it's a, yeah, it's a huge barrier to entry for sure. Yeah, when you're looking at okay, I could pay forty thousand dollars to do this, 
or I could go and do this over here or to trade or something and be making money and have amazing benefits immediately. Like I, you know, I, I might, as an accountant a tr that went to school and paid all that money, I might choose a trade if I had, if I had the ability to go back and do it again. Yeah, I can't, I think it might've been a recent um, video I, I watched with Rao Powell talking about NFTs and it was a more general conversation about the utility and, and use cases around blockchain. But he made the point that maybe a new model will come out with universities where there's like a revenue share model based on the actual students. So, uh, you know, a high performing student, especially one that's coming from an underprivileged area, might get sort of crowdsourced, crowdfunded with, you know, the equivalent of a, to a social token or an NFT or whatever it is that gets them through university. But then you, uh, as, as contributing and crowdfunding, you get a, a percentage of the spoils that they then generate, you know, later on in life. I don't know how all that works, but you might get weird models like that start to spring up as well. That would be very strange, right? Because I know. Like they, they, <laughs> cause we don't weird. even know how to predict good performers yet really very well. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, so it, that's... That. It was an interesting concept, but definitely uh, not a fully fleshed one just yet. And, and you think about it, right? Like what, what are the things that you learn in college? Like even business school, right? Like learning how to, you know, do your business, do, learning how to be an accountant, those type of things. Yeah. All of those things can be replaced by AI. Yeah. Like accounting is just if this happens, then this. So you're just plugging in the numbers like that. My job, my I mean, the theory behind it will definitely have a job for a while, at least. But like the actual like mechanical functions of my job that a lot of these accountants come out of school to take. I mean, it, it's going to be taken over by AI, finance, uh, economics. All of those things can be done through algorithms. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, so much, like, so much, much disruption coming in the next decade. Um, just makes me wonder how, how long it takes uh, and how early are we? It's hard to know. Um, you know, like they say, people overestimate what can happen in a year, um, but underestimate what can happen in 10. Um, so we're probably at that point now where, where it's all become suddenly public facing and there's a lot more awareness around it. But um, it might take a while before the true disruptions start to happen. I don't know. Be interesting. I don't know. I feel like it's going to happen very fast. Yeah, and it'll be like once it, it'll be a shock too if it does happen swiftly, like you know, in the space of six months, major industries just fall over. Like, what the fuck does that yeah. mean to the world? Um, yeah, you know, economically, like it could be really nasty. <laughs> it's going to be get weird, and there's going to have to be a lot of really smart people that come up and try to offer solutions and people are going to have to listen to them. I mean, but see, the thing is, you have to look at how long this technology has been around, like AI and computers and blockchain, like they've been, they've, the first paper on blockchain was written in 79. Really? Triple entry. Yeah. It was, it was written out before the technology existed. Wow. And AI was around, I mean, they started using AI in the eighties. Yeah, yeah. Was it Eliza or something? Or something, some Apple. Um, there was some some Apple language model they had in the eighties, and basically it was like a, you know it was kind of like your your general practitioner giving you some basic medical advice, and all it was really doing was ref reflecting your comments back to you in a different way. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, well, that, I've I've seen them use that <laughs> analogy and the, you know the sort of the godfathers of AI point back to that, saying there was that level of intelligence way back then. Yeah, and they also have things, so there's a differentiation between artificial life and artificial intelligence, right? Artificial intelligence is kind of more along the machine learning. What we're seeing now, these local language models where they're taking what you have, synthesizing it and putting it back at you. Yeah. Um, and artificial life is very different. Uh, it, it actually like tries to survive and, and replicate and you know, things, it, it passes the, what is a life form test, which is really wild, even back then. Wow, so I, didn't, I'd be, I didn't even know that. That's crazy. Yeah, it, it brought up this whole thing, this whole argument or discourse in the computer industry or the computer community where they were trying to define what is life. And he's like, well, I made these life. I made these little like bit creatures that are running around and they all have, you know, personalities, basically. That's just, just and, crazy. Mm hmm. 
it's pretty wild when I read it. I read it, it. It's a textbook that I've been trying to read and I've started like four times. But it blows my mind every time I get like through a page and I have to stop and think about everything that they just said. I'm like, this is insane. One day I'll get through it. Yeah, no, it's but, just, just nuts. So it's happening so quickly. Um, yeah, hard to know. Hard to know. I'm just uh, excited for the, the base videos every week to try and give me a bit of a brain dump on what to keep um, keep your eyes on next because there's just so much going on. Um, yeah, even being in the space, you know, having others oh, yeah. in the space. So we're a lot, we're able to like bring things to each other and share them. It's much better than just trying to find it all on your own. That's for sure. Oh, yeah. And part of the problem is like people are bringing stuff together and you still don't have time. You're like, okay, I'll come back to that. That, that looks really interesting. And then, you know, you just never get back to, to whatever it was or a few months later, like, oh, now it's come up again. I remember someone a few months ago mentioning this. I wish I covered it then, but uh, yeah, it's just, just crazy. Like, I don't know. Have you seen the, um, do you use Photoshop? You're oh yeah. Said, have you used the Firefly stuff yet? I have. It's pretty interesting. It's very illustrative, though. It's interesting. It's a very different than Mid Journey. Yeah, you kind of like, sort of, uh, you basically just input text on you know in human language what you want it within a certain um, part of your image, don't you? That that type of thing. You go and it gives you an option. Yeah, it will allow you to go in and piecemeal. There was another. I don't know what it was. There was another program that kind of allowed you to do that too. But I haven't seen it in, I haven't had my hands on one like Adobe. Right. Um, it's pretty interesting. It's interesting. I mean, it's it's all very weird. I don't necessarily like the images that it puts out as much. I'm more looking the at the, I just had a look at a couple of tweets of people showing um, just in the last sort of day, um, instances of using, a, I think it's the generative fill function. So you, you use like your lasso tool and select a part of an image and then just type in, you know, add add whatever it is. I want a frozen lake with reflections as one of the uh, examples, you know, down the bottom of your image. And it just, bam, there you go. It gives you three options. You hit next and, and suddenly you've got a whole, you know, extended version of an, of an original image with extra AI inputs into it. It's really wild. Looks like it's super user-friendly too from what I've seen, but you know, obviously had a, haven't had a chance to use it myself. Um, and I don't, I don't actually use Photoshop, I use Premiere for video stuff only, so I don't have access to it. But yeah, but I'm just that to me looks like a lot more user friendly than say Mid Journey, where obviously prompting, uh, it's it's almost quasi coding in a way. You know, there's there's syntax to it. Where with the Firefly one, you literally just tell it what you want in human human language, um, and it seems to just do it almost magically on the fly, which is pretty wild. Yeah, it, it's it's the coolest one because they've offered like four different products. This is the fourth product that they put out. Right. The this is the most useful, I think, of all the products that they've put out so far. They did one with letters, which was kind of fun because you could do like themes on your letter. Oh, I saw that one. Yep, yep. I did. I did some things with that. You probably saw on the server. And then they had another one where it was like Mid Journey. Yeah. And yep. the images from that were. I would say they're kind of like images that you're looking to fill like a book, yeah. right? Or a book. They were very, they weren't like actual, I took a photo of this. Some of them were, but just the general feel of it was that. Um, this one is a lot more interesting. I've used the content aware fill on Photoshop for a really long time. Yep. And it's impressive. I mean, it's not always perfect, but it's pretty perfect most of the time. Like it will pick up and like finish a room, which is pretty neat. Um, and, and it is a very useful tool, isn't it? Like, when would I use that? But I found that, you know, in my artistic endeavors over the past year, I've used them a decent amount, actually, once I learned about it, right? Because well, there's so much to learn in Photoshop. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's like any software product. Um, I mean, you're an Excel guru, aren't you? So, um, <laughs> and you're, you're, you're probably a complete propeller head at it, but you probably only know 2% more than any person of the 99% that's still available because <laughs> um, there's just so much to them. And um, that's that's what the, 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 def, the definition of an expert is someone that just knows that much more than you do pretty much. So um, certainly the case with software tools. Yeah, you know, just even, even the way people use things is very different. Like if you ever watch someone or guide someone through using Excel, um, it, it's quite the painful process. Anyone, and <laughs> even imagine. another good Excel user, you're just like, what are you doing? 
I didn't realize there was that many ways to, to use spreadsheet software, but obviously there is when you when you know what you're doing. So I'm a complete noob when it comes to, to spreadsheeting, but um, yeah. So no, that's, that's really interesting. Is there anything else that you wanted to cover today, uh, Michelle, especially around, you know, AI stuff and the murkiness um, around the, the ethics of it? I do, I do have one more thing. The, uh, it came up this week where someone had mentioned to me in one of the discords that they saw a news program that came out that was very biased about this one topic, this medical topic. And it just so happened that this this person and his wife are both kind of experts in the field, one through experience, one through being a, an actual psychologist. And okay. they he had considered taking AI and using that gentleman and kind of correcting some of his points and then releasing that into the world. And, you know, there's some discussion on it and it's, it's really interesting in, um, when you think about it, like it, does he have the right to use that person's image? Does that fall under artistic license? Yeah. Um, if, if the person's putting out false or inflammatory statements, like who has the right to correct it? Yeah, yeah, I, exactly. I, I think one of the things that I'm trying to wrap my brain around is like how much AI itself will be used to kind of rubber stamp something. So like that, the discussion we were having earlier about, um, you know, an artist's image and a likeness of, of it being used elsewhere. Will, will AI run through it and go, this is only 7% change and it needs to be 8%, otherwise you can get sued. According to the AI, it's yeah. only 7% different. You haven't changed that enough. Like, I don't know. And then how trustworthy is that AI? <laughs> so I think we'll have, to, like, we'll have to use AI to help govern AI, ironically enough. Like, how else can you do it and get some quantifiable answer out? I don't know how. Yeah, I, I don't either. Like even like the Chris Rock and um, you know the Kanye videos that we've been doing in the server. Yeah. Like well, when do they go that, that moral dilemma has come up already with a few of the people are like, I was going to do this. That was a, it was a funny meme, but it just didn't sit right with me. And um, because, you know, X, Y, Z ethically didn't feel right. So they didn't do it. Um, I kind of like, um, I think it was, I think it was Simon Wan made the point that things are getting so good that you, you can't sort of tell the difference. And when everything's so good, it all kind of looks the same now. And um, you lose some of that joy out of it, if you know what I mean. So, um, some of the earlier AI stuff, like the previous versions of Midjourney, apparently some people preferred that because it was obvious that it was AI, but only subtly so, where now it's getting to the point where it's, for some people, it's getting indistinguishable about, you know, what's real and what's not. And um, now, you know, if everyone's got this amazing tool, um, it kind of, you know, everyone can do it. And, and all of a sudden every image looks the same and um, it's not so artistic and, you know, not, you don't get as much joy out of it anymore. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, this is one of those those things, those arguments that came up when photography became big. Yeah, true. Because it's, everyone has a camera, uh, you know, everyone's going to be taking the same images. Do we need the same images? That kind of thing. I think it was the same when, uh, it, went, when it went from analog photography to digital. <laughs> you know, yes. the, the incumbents are always scared they're getting replaced by the next wave of tech. So it's kind of really interesting. Yeah. And, 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 you know, like, d it, does everybody take the same picture? No, not at all. I mean, everybody oh. takes very different pictures. I'm still shit at photography. <laughs> so. <laughs> it's important to know your limitations. Yes. But, you know, there's there's going to be people that have tastes for all the different things. And there's going to be uses for all the different things. Um, will people who are making magazines necessarily pay food photographers to come in when they could you know go on mid journey well it depends yeah. on you know like are they looking for a certain thing and can they get that thing out of mid journey or are they looking for a new or the creative input to make it like even if that artist uses mid journey to create the image they might be looking exactly for that artist specific view or yeah. take on the image um uh, i, guess I don't know individual artists will probably have their own language models you know, and and they will be uh, maybe gets down distilled down to the individual level, especially musicians and um, the likeness of their voices. And you know, maybe you've got to actually use their licensed language model 
um, which maybe is backed out by blockchain to prove that it came from that source or whatever to then use, uh, you know, use their talents in a digital way. I, I don't know. It's fascinating, really. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's always going to be people that want a real painting to hang on their wall or want a sculpture to put in their foyer. Like, yeah. Th- there's always going to be people that want that. Um, oh, it, it, totally. It, it's, it's it'll, it'll, it'll be held even in, in even higher regard, I think, um, to be honest, just because it's going to be less common. Yeah, it's a whole different skill set. Um, but you can see that in AI too, right? Because like you're going in there and you're going and putting in your your prompt, and and there's not just putting in the prompt. There's also the curating of the image. When do you know that it's done? And yeah. Do you go back and touch? How many iterations like, do you do? And yeah, how how subtly do you want to change one specific aspect of it or whatever? Yeah, and, and you know, like which which one of the mid journey pieces? It's more of a curatorial yes. stance than anything. Um, and, and you know that's the same thing with like I lost my train of thought. Never mind. <laughs> no, <laughs> I just you're, left you're right up. I mean, it's it's more. There's more questions and answers, and every every question you have raises ten others. It seems so. Uh, it is pretty wild. Um, cool. Well, um, thanks thanks for joining me in here today, Michelle. It's been been a pleasure chatting about all this weird stuff. I've got no answers really. <laughs> it's all it's all just it's all just <laughs> loose, it loosely too. loosely held theories at the moment because. You can't be, uh, you can't have a too strong an opinion on anything right now. I don't think. No, because you know everything's gray, and and, yeah. and I think the people that have the black and white opinions may not be as informed or considering all of the particular nuances that and they that's, should be. It's kind of okay because there's just so much to consider. But yeah, maybe don't be as vocal or um, you know, uh, don't be so strong on your opinions, perhaps. So. Um, I think that's kind of interesting when you have, have social commentators like this Dan Olson guy talking about, you know, Web3 and the metaverse. And I'm sure he's going to start taking down AI and all this soon. Like, he's probably working on his next video now. So, you know, people like that, um, I, I know Robin has a, has a bone to pick with him. So apparently they, he was actually engaging on him uh, on Twitter with Robin about uh, the, ho- the Holodeck and um, the Motion Capture Studio. So that'll be really interesting to see if anything comes out of that. But totally agree. It's... <laughs> It's just so hard to, to know. Um, I think that's one thing I do like about BASED is that they're not too uh, steadfast in any one view. That's They've already been quite fluid with what they've been producing and their takes on it all. I agree, you know, like you kind of have to, a lot of it's just kind of sit back and watch and see what happens because we have no idea what's going to happen when all of these tools and the new tools to come in the next even couple of weeks are going to impact humanity, right? Like someone might have been able to predict that that Pentagon bomb photo would drop the stock change but like who could predict that the news outlets would put it out so quick without verifying its source because that's a pretty big deal like you feel like you could turn on the news and check to see if it's on it's not even an amazing but, image right <laughs> you know um, oh. it's like seriously basic image of just like some, you know the building in the background a bit of black smoke and some shrubbery or something and it's just like wow okay better sell everything like <laughs> um I don't yeah, know. It's it kind of wild. Like, isn't there a web? YouTube. Is there a live webcam of the Pentagon from the outside? Maybe there should be. I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, maybe sure you have a look at that. It. Yeah. So I don't know. Wild times for sure. But um, cool. Well, um, thanks again, Michelle. Uh, we can do this again in two weeks' time, and maybe we'll get it working on Twitter. We'll see how we go. And it's been a pleasure. It's always a pleasure, Jerry. Thank you. No worries. See ya. Bye. Thanks very much for watching. If you enjoy this content, smash that like button, hit subscribe, and maybe consider watching one of my other videos. Bunnies up!